Alright guys, welcome back to the project. So in this one, we're going to be building a walnut and cherry hope chest, trunk, whatever you want to call it. It's basically just a big box. And so there's two reasons why this project came about. First off is the hinges. So you'll see these later on in the video, but the hinges that are getting put into this chest are a set of hand forged hinges that I bought from Horton Brasses. And that was kind of the number one reason why this project came about. I saw these hinges on their website and just knew that I wanted to do a project with them. The other reason for this project was because I just wanted to build something out of walnut. I so far to date haven't built any decent sized pieces of furniture out of walnut. I built that small tea cabinet a while ago from walnut and that was just fun. Walnut is just such a nice wood to work with because it machines easily, it's nice to work with the hand tools, it's just all around a really good wood to work with. And so I wanted to add a piece of walnut furniture to my portfolio and I figured that this would be the perfect time because it's not too complex of a piece where there's a high chance of messing something up, but it's also big and beautiful enough that you can really get a good feel of the walnut and really get a good, and, you know, get a good eye for it. And so the milling process for this walnut was super simple. Again, walnut mills absolutely easily. Uh, there really is no hard part about working with walnut other than you have to be very careful with what you're doing. If you're not careful with what you're doing, you can actually end up messing up pieces, which costs you lots of money in the long run. But if you take your time and really just focus on what you're doing, you can really get a good result. And so the whole chest is built with mortise and tendon joinery. Now again, working with this mortiser, which I'm still fairly new to, combining that with walnut is again, just easy. Compared to when I built the dresser, which was hard maple, this walnut just cut very easily. So I started by cutting a dado into all the pieces, then matched that up to the 3 8 mortising chisel that I had fit into my mortiser. From there, I could go through and add a simple groove around all of our inside pieces. Now, one of the things that I really like about this chest is that I took a similar design to the pie cupboard, which you guys may have seen me build a while ago, where all of our legs are built for the, with miters as their main joint. So rather than building with eight quarter stock to make post legs, these ones are kind of what I like to call hollow post legs. I don't, don't really know if there's an actual name for it, but it's just a method of building that I think works really well. And again, it's super strong. It's just as strong as working with a solid piece of wood carved in the same shape, because as soon as you glue those two long grain miters together, that is a extremely strong joint. So there's really nothing wrong with doing that. Then for all the floating panels in this thing, I wanted to use quarters on cherry. So again, this is a technique that as you guys know, I absolutely love the look when you take an eight quarter piece of stock and just rip it down into a whole bunch of thin strips and then glue it back up together. Now this project, this chest, I think if I'm remembering correctly has about 12 of these floating panels, which it means that there was a lot of cherry strips. I honestly have no idea how many I ended up cutting for this. I don't remember how many go into each panel, but there is a lot of Coruscant cherry in this panel. And so one of the big things you have to consider with cherry is that every piece looks different. Some pieces have a lot of curl to them. Some pieces have no curl. Some pieces have little ray flex in them and some have none. So you really have to be careful when you're putting the panels together to make sure that you get fairly consistent grain together with each other. But overall, these panels were super easy to get together. Again, cherry is another one of those woods that I really like to work with because it's just easy compared to pretty much anything else. Uh, it's a fairly soft hardwood, so it's easy to machine, easy to work, but yeah, it also just looks really, really good. And so with the panels all glued up, I could start to fit them to size. And so what we're going to be doing here is because we have those grooves running all to the inside, we're going to be using a cove profile bit to actually make them fit. Now the trick with these panels is I want this thing to look good from both the inside and the out. So I'll be adding the cove profile to both the inside and the outside of the panel. And so you can see here just how the details that are all the details that are going to be on the outside are also brought into the inside. And that was a really big goal of this whole project was to make the inside look just as good as the outside. Because again, a lot of the time you'll see woodworkers do things where, you know, you might hide like pocket hole screws, other poor forms of joinery, just because it's on the inside of a piece of furniture, you think no one's ever going to see it. But with an item like this, you're constantly opening it up and looking inside. 
Another feature I really like on this chest is the, the slight lifts I added to the bottom stretchers. So to make this piece feel a little bit taller off the ground than I actually wanted to build it, I added a one, or I took off about an inch of material from the center of each of these stretchers and then tapered that all the way down to the edges so that it blended smoother into the legs. And this is a really simple yet elegant approach to make your pieces of furniture just feel slightly taller. So without doing this, the trunk has about an inch of ground clearance, whereas after doing this, it creates two inches of ground clearance, which is a much more comfortable height. Now, it all depends on your personal preferences, but for me, two inches off the ground is right about where I'm happy and what I like the most. And so to make this extra strong and to add a little bit of visual interest, we're going to be draw boring all the mortise and cannon joinery on here. Now, this is one area of this project where I do have some minor regrets. I'm going with really small dowels on this, I'm going as small as 3 16 of an inch on all these dowels, which meant that they are very small, they're very easy to break, so the whole idea of draw boring is that you're applying a lot of force to those dowels to pull your joint together. But what I found out is that when you do that with small 3 16 inch dowels, the dowels sometimes are quite often actually end up breaking, so there's a little bit of repairs here and there to fix the dowels that I end up breaking, but overall it came together beautifully and I love the detail of the dowels on our legs because I also ended up making the dowels out of cherry which again brings in a little bit of that extra contrast but also because cherry end grain is a little bit visually darker than the cherry panels that we have on the rest of this piece they don't stand out in more visually than the uh, cherry panels so it still looks really good it's a nice subtle detail And so you can see in this shot here how tight I was able to get the mortise and tendon joinery. And this is one of the things I was really happy about with this project, was just how well everything fit together without glue, without any kind of dowels, any kind of support in it. I managed to get my joints really tight. And so doing a little bit of a dry fit up just to make sure that my dowel idea was going to work, I could then move on to actually making all the dowels. Now, for this, I wanted to make properly formed dowels, which a big part of that is splitting your pieces of wood with a hatchet, which then makes the, the break follow the grain. Then when you pound it into a dowel, the grain of the wood follows the direction of the dowel. With all my pieces ready to go, I could start moving into the finishing phase. So one of the things that I really like about finishing pieces like this is that it's just simple. There's, it's just all simple flat surfaces that you can get out the hand plane and just start cleaning up. Now, for this process, I always started with the hand plane and then moved on to 180 grit sandpaper. Because the hand plane does do, is a little bit more complicated, especially on this piece here. You can see that there's a big knot right in the middle. And so those knots will very often tear out, so coming back in with 180 grit sandpaper just cleans up any edges. I also added a nice subtle detail here that you can see by, by reducing the thickness of all of our middle dividers, just below the stretchers and the legs, we created a nice 3D effect to the overall frame here. So rather than just having a simple flat panel, you have a lot of intricate details getting mixed into this piece. And then it was on to finishing. So to finish this project, I used two coats of tried and true original oil. Now, I'm a huge fan of tried and true oils. They are probably the best finish in my opinion because they're so simple and provide a good amount of protection. Again, you have to remember when you're working with hardwoods, you don't need a plastic coating. The wood is hard enough to protect itself. So the good traditional oil finishes do an absolutely amazing amount of protection. Then for the glue up, I made sure to use Type on 3 because for doing this, I wanted as much open time as I could possibly get. There's a lot of pieces to get together and I wanted to not screw it up. So I started by doing the front and back frames because they were going to be the most complex. Uh, then I was able to move on to doing the side frames after I let the front and back frames dry for a little while. So with everything together, it was all very solid and again, there weren't really any clamps needed to do the glue up other than to a few areas where I wanted to pull my joints together a little bit tighter so that I didn't have to pound the dowels in as hard. And so I added a light chamfer to the top edge of this just so that when you're leaning into the trunk you don't brush your arm against the edge and cut your arm because 
when you're working with wood, you can get some very sharp edges, especially when you're using a lot of machinery. So you have to make sure to smooth those edges somehow. And this light chamfer that I put on the top worked an absolute treat. So with all of the trunk together, I could then start to install the hinges. So I decided to slightly inset these hinges. And again, because we have those different layers of depth, I had to take a decent amount of material off of our top stretcher to actually get these to sit flush. Now, depends on who you are and depends who you talk to, with hinges like this, you don't normal, normally cut a mortise for them. Normally, you would just mount them on and you'd leave a little bit of a gap between the lid and the base. But I didn't really didn't like the look of that, so I decided to lightly mortise them in, just below the surface of the wood on the top stretcher so that they would sit nice and flush. So you can see on the inside of the trunk, they do stick out proud, but on the top of the frame where the lid is gonna sit, they're completely flush. Then, for very simply for the bottom panel, I just went with three pieces of just flat sawn cherry to make a panel that will then go in the base. And so, for this panel, again, I wanted it simple. There was no point going through all the effort of making a quarter sawn panel to match the rest of the trunk, because as soon as you start to use this thing, this whole panel is going to get covered up anyway. But I still decided to stick with cherry because I really don't like when people cheap out on the internal areas. So it wasn't worth the effort of going fully to the quarters on panel, but it was worth the effort of putting a good, nice looking hardwood in the base there. There's also a good chance to use up some of my uglier pieces of cherry that had a little bit of sapwood to them, because again, it is going to be slightly hidden and all the ugly, really ugly sapwood areas were on the underside. So it's a little, you're literally never going to see it, which is a very nice use of some sa cherry sapwood. And so one of the important things about this panel is that it is removable. Again, anytime I do a base panel in pretty much any case, cabinet, trunk, whatever it may be, I always try to make it removable because this is generally the most common part to get broken or heavily damaged when a piece of furniture is in use. You know, you drop something into the trunk, uh, and you crack this panel, or you just dent it way more than you want to. So by having it replaceable, that just makes it easy to one, refinish if you need to, or two, replace it just in full. And so to support this in the bottom of the trunk, we're going to be gluing in some cherry stretchers that are going to go into the grooves that we cut into the walnut stretchers that are actually making up the frame of this thing. And so these pieces are extremely strong. They are fastened, or they're, well, they're glued into the walnut, so they are just as strong of a joint as the walnut is. So they are not going to break no matter how much weight you put in this thing. Once I got everything together, I actually stood in this thing and it, the whole frame of this was able to hold my 150 pound weight that was putting right on the center of the panel. So it's built like a tank, which is exactly how I like to build furniture. And so with all that in place, we could move on to the lid. Now, if you followed along with the build series of this project, you know that this is actually the second lid that I ended up building for this project. The first one was just a breadboard end top and just seemed very boring. I was not happy with the look of it when I finished it and there were some other minor issues, but mainly I just didn't like, like the look of how boring it was. So I went out, picked up this piece of eight quarter cherry and made a full quarter zone panel out of this cherry, which again, this is a big piece of wood to be re down into a bunch of small pieces. So it took a little while, but oh boy, was it worth it. It looks absolutely spectacular taking all these pieces, then gluing them back together to create a nice, large quarter zone panel. And so because these are still thick pieces, we had to go through the full milling process once we cut them off of the big eight quarter trunk. All these pieces are a little over an inch thick and that is very for a very specific reason because we're gonna be making it so that this panel, this cherry panel, sticks slightly above the walnut border that we're gonna be putting around it. And so this again just creates a good, really nice 3D effect to the whole piece.
And so for this panel, because I don't have a massive planer, I started by doing two separate glue ups. This allowed me to clean up the glue squeeze out, pass it to my planer so that they were both the exact same thickness. Then from there, I could glue those two separate panels together. And then I only had one glue seam to worry about cleaning up afterwards. So this is extremely important because we're gonna be adding some cove profiles and wrap it to the underside of this whole panel. So it's really important that it is as flat and accurate as we can possibly get it. And so with the panel all together, we could start moving on to the walnut frame. Now this walnut frame is built in a frame and panel manner, just like the rest of this trunk. And so I was very in intentional on the dimensions I took for this walnut. Because again, going back to the first one that I built, I went with four inch wide pieces, which just overwhelmed the amount of cherry in this and just seemed overly too large. So, and it didn't match the design of the trunk. So for this new lid, I went with two and a half inch wide pieces. So for the rest of the trunk, all of the walnut on it is two inch wide stretchers. And then on the bottom one, the bottom stretcher is three inches. So these two and a half inch ones that I used for the lid made it seem larger and a little bit more substantial than the rest of the frame, but not excessively so. It blended nicely with the rest of the piece of furniture, which is so important when you're working with fine furniture you want to make sure that everything seems like it goes together because that's that's the goal. You want it to actually go together. And so again here, we're going to be using Morris and Tenon joinery because, well, I love my mortiser. I think it is one of the best machines I've bought in a while and it's made such a massive difference to just my workflow in general. And you can't really be true Morris and Tenon joinery. And then when you throw in some dowels you to reinforce it, you just get you know, the best form of joinery in my opinion. Again, it may differ depending on who you are and you know, what techniques you like, but true mortise and tenon joinery is just, I, I love it. Just as much as I love like traditional oil finishes and that, the traditional mortise and tenon joinery is just so much fun to work with. And so now, on, now that we have the walnut frame together, we can start working on the large cherry panel. So on the underside, initially I was just gonna do a rabbit to make things nice and simple. But what I ended up deciding to do after the fact was I added it, once I cut the rabbit and it got everything fitting up nicely, I went back in with a V-point bit and added a little chamfer to the underside of the lid, which then blended everything so much better. On the top side, I just used the same cove profile bit that I use on all the other cherry panels, which again, help blend this and connect this nicely into the whole base frame of this trunk that I built. So again, it's connecting those ideas, those similar design patterns, the, you know, coloring profiles, whatever you want to call them, blending them together, making sure this whole piece look like it's one thing. And so then we move back to making some dowels. So for the, for the lid here, I decided to go with quarter inch dowels using the same forming method that I did for the rest of them, but quarter inch because I wanted them to be, again, a little bit larger. Not a lot, just a little. So at a sixteenth of an inch larger than the ones we used on the rest of the trunk, they do stand out a little bit more, but again, not enough that they're distracting from anything else. And so one of the really nice things about working with these quarter sawn panels is that they just work and clean up so very easily. I can use my hand plane along pretty much the whole surface of this, to get it all nicely cleaned up because it doesn't tear out anywhere nearly as much as flats on wood. So using the hand plate to do the majority of the work, I can really skip all the grits of sanding and then just again, come back with 180 grit sandpaper to just clean up the last bits in pieces. For the frame of the lid, I went with the same method of creating a couple different depths. So our outer side pieces are our thickest depth, uh, but they still sit below the level of the cherry panel. Then the long stretchers sit again just below the thickness of the side pieces. This overall just creates a very interesting, a little bit more dynamic depth and feeling to the look of this piece.
And so one of the important things to mention about this lid design compared to the first one is that this is a very this is meant to be a very very decorative lid. It's not meant to be something that you keep in your bedroom that you know you sit on to put your socks on in the morning. That's not what this lid's designed for. It's meant to be ornamental, it's meant to be decorative, and meant to be pretty. So if you want if you're looking to build a trunk that is meant to be sat on, to be used as a functional piece of sitting furniture, then I'd stick with the breadboard ends. But if you want to make something that is ornamental and designed to look beautiful, this is a much better way to go in my opinion. And so with that all together, I could then mount the lid onto those beautiful hand forged hinges and call this project pretty much done. So as you can see in this shot, there are still some areas where I need to touch up with some finish, but I will do that off camera and then you guys will get to see just how good this thing looks in the final shots.